there'll be many a book written about how foolish the whole thing was. So uh, we're supposed to be skeptics. Uh, my mother of lesson memory, uh, I came home once and I said, you know, uh, the teacher said this and this and this, and I'm very disturbed by it. Uh, I think it was in uh, biology or something. And my mother, in her good Yiddish way, she said, So he said it, so what? Who says that's right? So the Torah itself, which has so many layers to it, the Torah has a built-in skepticism. And that's where the Medrash comes in. The Medrash is, so to speak, the anti-belief in the literal story of the Torah. And without the Medrash, then the Torah doesn't make much sense. If you don't uh, fill in the details, so to speak, or fill in at least the background, or understand the motives of the people involved, so then uh, you're operating in a desert. So then people say, oh, oh, that's a medrash. The medrash does not come to tell you accurate facts. It comes to tell you the skeptical view of what is written. Once you understand that, you have got a tremendous treasure. You're able to move along. And that's the greatness of Rashi. Rashi chooses Midrashim. Because Rashi wants us to understand that the Torah is not to be taken uh, in the literal sense. And that's Torah Shabal Peh. So, ayin tachazayin, shein tachashein, a tooth for a tooth, an arm for an arm. The Torah doesn't mean that. Because when you look at it, you have to be skeptical of it. How could there be? Is that justice? What do you gain by putting out the other eye? So the Gemara says, Mama, what the Torah meant was monetary payment, medical expenses, damages, the laws of torts as we know it. So that's the deeper understanding of Torah. The deeper understanding of Torah is, so to speak, the anti-belief. The Torah didn't mean what it said. The Torah is telling us something. And <clears throat> Chazal and all of the great commentators throughout the ages <clears throat> have spent all of their efforts in ferreting out what the Torah is trying to tell us. And to every generation, it sounds different because it's talking to us. We hear a nuance in it that previous generations never heard. And our grandchildren will hear a nuance that we didn't hear. And that comes from this power. So in the Chumash of Dvorim, when we're all gathered in shul to hear it, in the Parsha of Et Hanan, Moshe Rabbeinu describes the story of the Miraglim again. And it's a completely different story. Moshe there doesn't say God told him to send spies. It says, All of you came. And you said to me, We want to send. You know, if you buy an automobile, you, you're entitled to a test drive. We're going to go to Eretz Israel without knowing anything. We're going to a strange land. You know, we have to have some knowledge of the land. 
we would say, you know, the Mossad should uh, tell us a little about it. As Shabak, we should know what's going on. Maybe we're going. No, Simanachnu el Amokom. Moshe, you want to go? What are you talking about? Send people, and we'll find out. And Moshe says, I agreed. Moshe does not say that he was, uh, so to speak, charged by God with a mitzvah to send. It seems to be a uh, voluntary decision on his part in response to the demands of the people. And many times leadership, no matter how great, no matter how mighty, has to respond to the, what the will of the people is, even if the will may not be so correct. We have countless, countless uh, examples of that. Chazal say, ain't melech b'lo'om. There is no king without people. So you have to have the people. Now you have to know when to listen to the people, how much to listen to the people, and who are the people. Shovel HaMelech's uh, tragedy is that he was too dependent on the people. Too dependent on, I would say that he uh, probably did too much internal polling. And the pollsters came and told him, you know, they don't want to kill Amalek. But we see that throughout Tanakh, the Rabboni Sholem sent Nevi'im to the kings of Judah and of Israel. The Nevi'im are the skeptics. The Nevi'im are the ones that put it into perspective. The prophets are the ones that said, no, 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 no. Shmuel Anovi says to show what his weakness is. You are small in your eyes. You're the king. What are you talking about? Listen to the people. The Gemara uh, and Sota says that Vachris Ayomim the end of days and the generations of the preceding the messiah etc which we hope we're in that time it says the face of the leaders of the people will be like the faces of dogs now what does that mean i mean one thing's for sure it's not a compliment Though there are some handsome dogs in the world, but most of us don't want to resemble a dog. And uh, the word dog itself in English and Kelev in Hebrew, and I think in all the languages of the world is not a compliment. So Rabbi Sol Salanter in his inimitable fashion says, what does it mean, Pnei Ador Pnei Akelev? So he says, you will notice when a dog runs, it always stops and turns around to see if the master is following. He says, There's a, there are generations when the leaders always turn around to see how much popular support they have. That they have 65% uh, in the polls. Otherwise, even though they know what they're doing is right, they wouldn't do it. So from the uh, incident of the spies as recorded in Chumash Dwarim, Moshe, so to speak, is the one that bows to the will of the people. They want to send spies. And therefore, that's the tragedy. 
So the Mephorshim look at it, there are different streams in the Mephorshim, all of which are correct and all of which apply in certain times in the, in the Jewish world. One stream is our Parsha, Shlach. God told you, do it, that's it. The fact that it didn't turn out, that's God's problem. Moshe, so to speak, is blameless. Moshe sent the best people. They have freedom of choice. They had all sorts of political and personal reasons for not wanting to go to Eretz Israel. For not doing something, there is always abundant reasoning. So uh, that's the way our Parsha looks. But Rashi already, in one nuance, already warns us that's not the correct way to look at it. Rashi he says, Shlach lecho. It says, lecho, you. So Rashi says, Ani eneni I'm not telling you what to do. If you want to send, if you don't want to, don't send. Moshe's ball is up in your hands. You want to do whatever you want to do. So Rashi concentrates on the Midrashic interpretation of the word lecha. Already indicating some of my, I lost you. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? I hear you. I don't oh. think we have a problem. Okay, I have a problem. I don't see anybody anymore. But, oh. But all right, as long as you can hear me. Yeah, we hear you. So Rashi points out that the lachor is that it was always up to Moshe. It was never what appeared that it was a tzivui from the Rabboni Shalola. It was up to you, you judge it, Moshe. You think you've got the right people? You think they're gonna do what you wanted to do? You think they're gonna come with a positive result? Okay, send. And there's another point that the Mephorshim also point out. Why did he send 12? He sent 12 Jews, he expect unanimity? We see that his uh, successor, Yoshua, only sent two. If you send two, you got a chance. You send 12, you're never going to get a unanimous decision. That's one of the ideas that lies in English and American jurisprudence. They have a jury of 12 people. There are statistics that the likelihood of getting 12 people to agree, no matter how convincing the evidence is, is not that great. Because people have their own opinions and they have their own prejudices and they see things differently and they hear things differently. So it's very hard to get a unanimous decision. And therefore, you have many a hung jury and many a case that can never be decided because you couldn't get unanimity. What do you mean you send 12 people? And uh, Yoshua sent two, he sent Kolev and Pinchas who uh, Kolev already was the second time around, and Pinchas was someone who had proven himself at the sacrifice even of his own life to stand up for the immoral right and commands of God. So Yeshua is on safe ground. 
Moshe was on very treacherous ground. So to say that it was a tzivui from the Rabboni Shalom, a commandment from God, and that's what Moshe did, is undercut by the repetition of the story of the Chumash of Dvorim. And Rashi here already weakens it just with this nuance on the word Lecho. Rashi's genius lies that in one or two words, he's able to illuminate the entire scene. But we're able to understand. Rashi, as I mentioned to you, is the ultimate skeptic. They say, I quoted this to you many times, that uh, the, the, in the Parsha, of Ayeshev, uh, the Rajbam, Rabbeinu Shmuel ben Meir, who's Rashi's oldest grandson. And uh, Rashi was his uh, main teacher. And he's one of the founders of the school of the Balitosphists, Tosophists, who took it upon themselves to disagree with Rashi, with, many, many times, even though he was their teacher. But anyway, he says that he's Vakachti Mskeni. I had a discussion with my grandfather. And I said to him, originally, when you began your parish to Chumash, which everyone held was Rashi's supreme contribution, even though the parish to the Talmud is uh, unbelievable, and without it, we would be nowhere. But uh, his other grandson, Rabbi Tam, Yaakov Tam said that uh, regarding the parish to the Talmud, he said, I could have done it too. But his parish to Chumash, he said, nobody could have done, only Rashi could have done it. So he said, the Rashbam said to Rashi, uh, you said originally that when you set out on this project of the parish on Chumash, you said, uh, I'm only coming to tell you the ex simple explanation of the Bosak. And yet he said, your parish is basically Medrash, uh, Chazal, it's not Pshutar Shalmikra, it's not the literal what the Pasik says. And he said, the Hodali Skeni, he admitted it. He said, yeah, that's true. And he said, if I have time, I'll write another parish that'll be Pshutar Shalmikra. That'll be the simple explanation, which he didn't do. But what did Rashi think? Rashi's also aware. He didn't answer that to his grandson because we're very happy when our grandchildren discuss Torah with us or even disagree with us in matters of Torah. That's called nachas. I, I have in the back of my mind to offer a course, nachas 101. We, how parents and grandparents should accept nachas from their descendants once they realize that their descendants are not necessarily, they are the same ones they are. But in any event, what did Rashi say? Rashi said, no, this is the correct parish because if you understand it, you have to understand it with the whole background. You have to look at it skeptically. You have to try and ferret out what did the Pesach say? Why did the Pesach say, Shlach Lecho? Oh, it's telling me what it told me in Dvorim. Moshe, you had a much bigger hand in this. You're just not the conduit that sent spies. You had a choice in the matter. 
and your choice was influenced because Vatikavu and Eli Kulchem. As Rashi points out in Dvarim. What does it say, Kulchem? All of you came. All of them came. It's, uh, three million people came to his door. So Rashi says, Kulchem means that you came in, as a disordered mob. Old, young, wild, without any set agenda. Everyone with a different complaint. This one's complaining about the food. This one's complaining about this. This one's complaining about the leadership. Korach wants this. Everybody wants something else. Birvuviorah, she says. You came as a mob. Well, we're well aware of what it looks like when a mob comes. And Moshe succumbed. Moshe sent. He thought that somehow we would appease them. And it turned out very badly. So here we have, I think, a clear example of how to look at the Chumash. How to be able to see it from all of its sides and facets. How to realize what the Torah is trying to tell us. The Torah is telling us that if you send 12 people, you don't get unanimity. The Torah is telling us that if it's sent because of mob rule, it's not going to go. The Torah is telling us that people have choices. Even Moshe Rabbeinu has choices. And that we have to live with the consequences of our choices. And the Torah is always tell, also telling us that things don't always turn out the way we want them to turn out. They don't always turn out, so to speak, well, good, great. But we would have expected to come back with, you know, uh, apples the size of watermelons that we would be impressed. But the Torah is telling us that people have predetermined ideas. And that facts don't always change those ideas and don't always influence the behavior of others. Therefore, this is, uh, in my opinion, whatever that's worth, you know, when I was younger, I thought it mattered. But uh, as I grow older, it, uh, I realize it may not be that important. But in any event, I, for me, this is uh, one of the key parshas in the Torah. It uh, has uh, all of the lessons of society and of human choice and of human behavior and of leadership all encompassed in it. But it has to be seen in its totality. It is what the Mephorshim say. And the Mephorshim attempted to weave the tapestry to join all the pieces so that somehow we would be able to make this lesson real and uh, have an eternal debt for the teachings of the Torah and what it implies for us. I want to tell you how wonderful it is to be back here in Yerushalayim and to be in contact with you. So many of you have called. I appreciate every one of you. And uh, people say you want to sleep in your own bed. I know you want to dive in your own shul. That's what, really what it is. That's what I look forward to. And I look forward to the great people. You know, you have to go away to appreciate what you have. I uh, went away for uh, Pesach, and then it ended up Pesach Sheni, and then it ended up Shuz. And uh, if I took a vote uh, of my family, uh, I would still be in America. But uh, 
for me, this is home. And uh, you are my family. And so I thank you all for watching. And I want to especially thank Morty Terrigan for guiding me through the wilderness of Zoom. And uh, Mir Tzashem will talk Sunday on Pirkei Ovos. Everyone should have a Shabbat Shalom. And please, please stay well and careful. And we'll hear good news one from another. Shalom Uvracha. Amen. It's only 16 years. Go up, Rabbi. Rabbi Warren, do you know how to get out of this? On the bot, if you move your, first of all, just move your cursor. The screen should come back. I moved, but it didn't come back. But what well, I come back. Look at your mouse, your mouse. Huh? Your mouse, that didn't help. You want me to come in and try and see what happens? What, 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 what you can do whatever you want. No, no, I, I don't want to come into your computer without your permission. You can come into my computer. I have nothing on my computer that's hidden. Oh, I got. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Rabbi Wine. I just want to remind everyone um, that uh, we've liberalized this weekend, which means that people over the age of 70 are permitted to enter into the show, uh, obviously on their uh, uh, taking their own risks. And please, God, uh, we should have more people this, this Shabbos as a result. But if you do want to come, there's a registration requirement. The uh, registration form is linked to either on the home page of the website or in the email uh, which Mark sent out yesterday has a link to that registration form so that we know how many people are coming uh, and we do find that we're overpopulated. Anybody else has anything? Ellie, uh, can we come if we don't hear a confirmation on our request for a reservation? I think Mark usually sends those confirmations out on Friday afternoon. Uh, okay. So, yeah, um, you probably can anyway, but I should, if Mark's not there, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I think Mark may have left, so probably safe to come. Even okay. You should receive on Friday. You can't off. come anyway. You just have to fill out the form. Yes. Yeah. Where do you get the forms? Yeah. On the computer. Um, the website. On the site. Has a link. <laughs> How do we get out of this? I, I'm trying. I can't. Uh, no, no, no. I can, I can end the session for everyone because I'm hosting. You see where the cursor is? I, I'm trying to click there, but it's not clicking. If you could move, if you could click it right there. Do you want me to end? I can end the session now for everyone. Everyone's happy to say goodbye to Rabbi Wine and please God, we look forward to seeing you.